Hello, I'm Eric Snodgrass, and thank you for watching this Ag Forecast for Australia, brought to you by Nutrient Ag Solutions. We'll do a quick review here of our cold season and the precipitation anomalies we've seen. And remember, an anomaly just means a difference from normal. We're going to go back and use the bomb data here uh, starting in June. So much of Australia did see above normal precipitation, but it is important to point out that back in June, we were drier in parts of Western Australia and right here along the coast. But the interior parts of New South Wales, Queensland, getting over to South Australia did see quite a bit of additional precipitation compared to normal. Let's fast forward a month and go take a look at the month of July. And what we've got now is a little bit different scenario. We did get a drier stretch in through here, not by much, about 10 millimeters below normal. But we were still wet, pushing up against the mountains here at higher elevation and also a changeover in the pattern in parts of Western Australia. Now just thinking about that, I want to then look at what we've seen lately. So our next graphic here is month to date. So this is from the beginning of the month uh, through the 18th, and or through the 19th, excuse me. And we remember two weeks ago when we were forecasting, we did see a drier forecast moving forward. We kind of blamed a lot of that on some shifts in the MJO and also a, a tightening of the circulation around, uh, around the, the South Pole. And overall, that forecast has verified relatively well. As you see here, in some places we were, we were down anywhere between 10 and maybe upwards of 50 millimeters of rain. So the model performance at this point has been uh, what I would say is acceptable. We can use it going forward here. We're going to do that not only for Australia, but we're going to look around the globe at the end of this video. So let's check in on a few of our important factors here, and we're going to first look at our water balance by looking at root zone soil moisture. We're going to look at two different sources today. So uh, we're just ranking this against average, so you can kind of see the different uh, percentages here uh, that, that represent the map that's over there on the right. And what I wanted to do is I wanted to take a look at that map, and you can look at your particular region very carefully here, and I want to compare it to, to some other data we have, primarily the data from a satellite as a part of NASA called GRACE. And overall, I look at these two particular maps, and I am quite impressed with how well they line up. So again, this is GRACE, and this is what we have from BOM. And as you can see, as I go back and forth here, we do see very good similarities overall. Now, this is kind of our base state. We're going to see where we're going to be changing from this map moving forward. And the other thing I want to add to that is I'd like to do a quick analysis using some NDVI imagery. So we're going to compare 2021 uh, through about August 10th to 2020 through about the same time period. Now, when you look at these graphs, just remember that these values over here represent very healthy vegetation. And again, I know we're looking here in the month of August, but it's still important to look at. This is a healthy side of the color spectrum, and this would be the less healthy side. Now, what we're going to do is what you're looking at here, first of all, is a year ago. And as we slide this over, we'll see the new data. And I'm going to zoom in just so we get a better look at this, okay? Let's take a look at New South Wales, Victoria, and parts of Queensland there. In fact, I'd like to include Tasmania as well. There we go. So you're looking at last year. And now we're pulling over to see this year. Now, down here in Victoria, this is some cloud contamination. These dark blues, that's cloud contamination, okay? But as we go back and forth between last year and this year, I do notice that in certain places, especially at higher elevation here, we do see the conditions look better a year ago from space than they do now. But overall, when we look at the quality of the crop here, there's still quite a bit of good land right in through here that's showing up with high values. Now let's slide from here a little bit farther over toward uh, the west. And if we kind of zoom in here, we'll try to include, let's, let's get another good view here of the, the fields in and around Adelaide. Let's do it again. So this is a year ago. And as I slide this over, we're going to see this year. Now overall, if we just focus in on parts of Western Australia, we see that a year ago compared to this year, things look a lot better this year from space. Just one of the many tools we can use to kind of assess how things go. Now, on any individual field, you're going to see some big differences. I'm looking at the holistic, the larger picture here. All right. Now, where are we going in this pattern? A lot of it has to do with the jet stream level winds, and that's what I'm showing you here. What we're looking at here is over the South Pole. So this, of course, is Antarctica. And what I notice is that we have many short waves going around the pole. And the more short waves we have, the more progressive the pattern is. In other words, the more it changes. I also noticed this right here, south of Africa, and then coming over to Australia, you do have this, what I would call a polar branch of the jet stream. I kind of didn't do a very good job outlining it, but I'm talking about this. And then you have this more subtropical branch, which is here. And that's what's screaming across parts of southern, uh, the southern part of Australia. Now, overall, what I see and I look at a pattern like this is a lot of the action is going to be on that polar branch, which means this would point toward a drier pattern overall. And we're going to look at that first, because what we're looking at here is your next 15 days, all put into one map, 
from the 12Z European model today. And what it suggests here is that overall we're looking at near normal precipitation across much of the continent. But there are going to be places that might possibly pick up a little bit of extra precip right in through here and possibly in this little pocket here. But outside of that, the interior still looks at a near normal to slightly drier than normal condition. We're going to take a look at this again next week to see how well the models did. Now to show you what's going to be happening, let's go straight over to our kind of six hourly map here. And if I just play this forward, you're just going to see something here. A lot of these systems just stay south. But we are going to watch early next week for a low right over here in parts of New South Wales and Victoria to form, which may possibly really increase the amount of rainfall along the coast. And you can see it's kind of curling up right here next Tuesday uh, into a low. Now, Other than that, we just don't see a whole lot of precipitation getting added up here. And that's why I'm kind of playing through it relatively quickly. Because I want to show you the same thing, but let's just add up the precipitation as we go. This is, the again, the European 12Z run from today. And so through the weekend, let's just park this right here on Sunday afternoon. We can see we have chances for scattered showers in Western Australia, but we're not talking about much precip at all here. Same thing for South Australia, getting a new South Wales and Victoria. We're not adding much. Tasmania really seeing some heavy rain as this pushes up against, you know, the windward side of the island here. Same thing for coastal parts of New Zealand. But that was through Sunday afternoon. Let's keep playing this through into Monday. And then, like I said, early next week, we were watching that low take shape here, so we could start to increase the coastal precipitation amounts. But outside of that, this is out five days from now, next Tuesday. If I just keep playing this forward, we're really not keeping that storm track too far to the north. And through the next 10 days, this is how kind of how things add up. A much farther to the south storm track here is really kind of preventing us from picking up a lot of excess precip. And that's just one part of this whole picture here. Let's keep going. If we then look exclusively at week two, so this is just going to be all the way out to September the 2nd. Overall, what we've got is possibly bringing a couple of fronts that could clip this part of Western Australia. But in general, we do see that the models out to week two are favoring a drier, uh, near normal to drier pattern once you get over here to the eastern side all right, of, of the country. So that's what we're getting from the European ensemble out to week two. And I'm tending to buy this pattern overall, given where I'm seeing the jet stream flow at this point. Let's go ahead and talk about temperatures real quick, and then we'll expand this out. Let's shrink that up so you can see it. There you go. This is how your next five days are shaping up. Generally speaking, along our southern coast, we're seeing your normal temperatures, warmer in the interior and farther to the north. But that pattern is about to change once you get out there past day five. And looking at the day five through ten time period, we tend to favor warmer conditions in the interior of Western Australia. But there's going to be some cooler air that comes in here on several fronts, cooling things down. And like we did last time, we had a concern over what this might mean for the potential for some frost. I think we should better, better take a look at what that potential looks like. So remember, on these maps, we're looking for the probability of getting a temperature below 4C, okay, below 4 degrees Celsius. That's what's shaded here. And as I slide this forward, we're going to see that going through Friday into Saturday, much of this is going to be confined to higher elevation, which we expect. But let's go beyond that into next week. Because at that point, our first front starts to come through, and we now start to see a better chance of getting those temperatures below 4C. So that means in lower elevations, if the atmosphere gets really still and got clear skies, you could bottom out with some patchy frost. That's why we're looking at this. And as you noted, beyond about day four or five, we start to really see those chances increase. So now we're looking at zero Z on Tuesday. And again, we see a lot of area in through here that does run that risk of getting down there below 4C and possibly seeing a frost event. Keeping on, this is as things shape up on Wednesday at zero Z, sorry, right there. And then going out here to Thursday. So I want to keep a very close eye on this because these temperatures are dipping pretty chilly and we need to know if they're going to be getting down there around that freezing mark and what that could do some patchy frost. If y'all see any of it, please take a picture and send it to me. I'd like to just know how well the models are performing. All right. Let's keep going though. Let's go out there to the 27th. Again, this is our cooler shot of air coming in there. We're all the way out here at day seven. Okay. So we're watching that. And then uh, we go out there to day eight and then day nine, which would be next Sunday, the 29th. And overall, we see we go back to our normal pattern here, of primarily keeping those cooler temperatures at higher elevation. Now that gets us through a quick look here at temperature and precipitation. But what I like to do in this video is really focus on the longer term. One of the big wild cards has been the movement of the MJO. Now just remember something, each one of these eight phases stretches from Africa out into the Central Pacific Ocean. And the phases that are over us are phases five and four. Now the MJO recently came out into phase one, here into phase two, 
and it was forecast to move over these phases, phases four and five. But the newest forecast has it collapsing back into what we call null space, which is almost a reset mode, and then popping out again back into phase one. That is why the pattern seems to be on a bit of a wash, rinse, repeat, keeping that storm track farther to the south, limiting our ability to get above normal precipitation through the next about 10 to 15 days. Then the models say get the MJO going again. And all the way into September, mid-September, that's when it's trying to pull it back over into what we call the maritime continent, which again, phase four and five are, no over, are just north of Australia. Now, the reason why I bring this up is because that's one of the more dominant tropical modes we're dealing with right now. And let's just go see what the models are suggesting. You see, if I were to show it to you another way, let's just look, I don't know, I'll click on this one. It's a good example. Through the next 10 days, because that MJO is focusing on a reset, we notice we have general subsidence across Australia. That's less supportive of preset, pushes that jet stream pattern farther to the south. What we're gonna watch over here is the development of tropical systems coming up to the United States. I got my sights on that very closely right now. But another way to think about this is just understand what the ocean temperature is doing in res with respect to that. So see the cooler water emerging right here? There's a lot more below the surface that's gonna come up. And the trade winds have been strong. We have a positive southern oscillation index. I talked about that last time. We do expect this La Nina to con continue to develop through your spring time period. Now thinking about that, let's go out and take a look at what the September precipitation anomalies look like. And that's what you've got here, September 1 through September 30th. And in general, because of that La Nina, and because the MJO is going to be moving by the time we get into September over toward phases, well, three and then four and five, we start to see streaks of possibly having some above normal precipitation. But this is not calling for overly wet conditions. But this is what we're looking at through the month of September. Now, does Baum agree with it? Let's go take a look. This is their one month forecast for the month of September, looking at the chance of exceeding median rainfall. And they have that same area, as I just pointed out from the European model, favored wet, and also this region favored dry. Very consistent forecast between Baum and the ECMWF. What about out there to the next three months? Now what we're looking at is the September to November outlook on precipitation. And much of the eastern two-thirds of the continent is favoring above normal precipitation or drier west. Now does the ECMWF agree with that? Well, this is that forecast. And overall, it seems as though BOM and the ECMWF are in lockstep with the pattern moving forward. Bigger picture things, though, as we are heading toward another growing season here, is that we've got this La Nina developing. This is October, November, December. The second run of this La Nina is coming. We have cooler water over here and warmer there, which means we're probably gonna keep the Indian Ocean Dipole negative. And overall, that does favor better chances for rain. Doesn't mean it's gonna be wet across the entire continent. It just says those things come together. We tend to not struggle with major drought development. That's the key takeaway message going into October, November, December. Now, just to show you what that Indian Ocean Dipole is doing, remember, when it's in its negative phase, kind of see the graphic over here, you get better rising motion. And we do see that the Indian Ocean Dipole is negative right now and will likely stay down here as we progress through the next three to six months. So that's our long-term forecast. Now, other things around the world affecting what we grow in Australia, why don't we start off first in the United States? Because this is what our, our evening is looking like across California. The winds have shifted out of the north, and all of this is wildfire smoke. Right now, the United States, we've burned over 4 million acres this year. It's turning out to be a terrible year for fires, and it's not going anywhere anytime soon. California is having an exceptionally dry summer after having a very dry winter, and it won't rain again in California until we get into October. That's the normal start of the wet season for California. So there's been some major problems because you add to that the fact that right now, not only California, but Oregon and Washington, those are the states to the north, are having a record-setting hot summer. This is the first time on this satellite image right here that they've seen some decently cool air in a very long time. Now, as we look forward in the forecast, I just wanna show you something here. Where we've been extremely wet has been through our cotton belt, which is right down through here. Much of our northern corn belt has been very, very dry over the last week, and it's been very hot here too. Temperatures getting over 40 Celsius. But this was where Tropical Storm Fred went through. And if you notice, I know it's in inches, but we have a lot of places that got six to 10 inches of rainfall out of that. And by the way, I live right here. I know I've told you that a few times in a city just to my north right here, it's called Gibson City. They had 10 inches of rain as well, and it completely submerged the town. So we've seen some very heavy precipitation in select areas. 
Over the next week, the Canadian prairie, the northern plains of the United States, are getting rainfall they wanted eight weeks ago. And this is not going to do much to improve the quality of the crop here, unfortunately. We're drier to our south, but very stormy and wet over our cotton belt and peanut belt. That's what we got going on down here. Now let's go from there and talk about what's happened across the U.S. this July. I told you it was record hot here. And we're going to see those temperatures rebound once again in that area once we get past the next 10 days or so. So speaking of the next 10 days, why don't we go take a quick look at what's going on across Europe. We have a big low pressure system that's curling here into Scandinavia. And then we have another one that's going to cut right in through there. But out ahead of this, through parts of Kazakhstan and into Russia, major heat wave baking this part of the Russian wheat belt. It's also hot in the Iberian Peninsula and across the southern part of Europe as well, including Turkey. So very hot south and cooler to the north. And over the next 10 days, that frontal boundary sweeps through and does bring in some rain into parts of Poland, over into parts of northern, this is northern Ukraine, and even into parts of southern Belarus. But where that heat's coming on, not much precipitation at all. France, Iberian Peninsula, so Portugal and Spain, dry as well. That's your update on what's going on across Europe. I'll finish with what's happening over in Asia. The southwest, excuse me, not the southwestern monsoon, we have that in the U.S. The Indian monsoon has been underperforming as of late, and the interior has been quite dry. Each new wave that comes up is having a difficult time getting through this area, and as a result, we've seen the, the Indian monsoon at times really kind of fail to produce. But we have a frontal boundary in through here we get at this time of year called the Mei Yu Front. And Beijing sits about right here. And so south of Beijing to the Yangtze River, this whole area, extremely heavy rainfall. Also wet in the North China Plain and Manchurian Plain as well, which is here and here. So we're going to keep a close eye on those two regions uh, as well. And what I want to finish with is a quick look at the forecast for this upcoming October, November, December for South America. The models have keen in on the drought development that we've endured or have endured since uh, the end of the last growing season throughout much of this winter time period, bringing in a lot wetter weather over parts of Brazil, though. Now, I know this is primarily for, for soybeans, but they will start planting on September the 15th if the rains return to this area. But it seems to be dry in southern Brazil and dry in the forecast for Argentina as well. And that La Nina that's developing will reinforce this. I'll keep you updated on what's going on around the world in our next video as well, okay? Appreciate your attention. Have a good rest of your week and weekend, and we'll talk to you again in a couple weeks. Thanks.